We are, in, we are in week six of this series called Battle for Our Hearts. What we've been doing is we've been looking at the idols, the, the false gods that are, are battling for the throne of each and every one of our hearts. And what we've talked about is how an idol is anything that we love more than God, trust more than God, and obey more than God. Love more than God, trust more than God, and obey more than God. We've looked at things like money, possessions. We've looked at status, success. Uh, and last week we looked at love. But today we look at this topic called they must be doing something right. We look at the influential people in the world and think that they must have it together. They must be doing something right and they influence us. Over the last couple of years, and the, the title influencer has been used more and more because of social media. Uh, social media influencers are, are people who are on social media that influence others to purchase products, to do something, to think something, to believe something. And it may sound ridiculous, but a, a study showed that 85% of people say that a, a celebrity or social media influencer, if they promote a product, they're more likely to purchase that product because they endorse it. Not only are they more likely to buy it, but it also increases their confidence in that product. Simply because someone's on social media and endorses it. But influencers are more than just social media influencers. We have all kinds of influences in our lives. Our spouses influence us. Our parents influence us. The media influences us. Politicians influence us. And so what we're going to talk about today is what role does an influencer play in our life and how do we best judge if they should influence us or not? And thankfully for us, the Bible actually has an influencer. He wouldn't go by that name. The title wasn't given in the first century. But that's what he was. He was an influencer. His name was John. John was a cousin of Jesus, born six months before Jesus was born. And he went out ahead of Jesus, and he influenced all kinds of people. John was famous for one thing. What was it? Baptism, right? John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had a huge following. His followers kept going up and up and up. Why? Two reasons. Number one, God had been silent for 400 years. For 400 years before this, God hadn't sent a single prophet to Israel, and then John came on the scene preaching God's word to the people. And John's message was different. It wasn't just geared at the average Jew. John preached against the hypocrisy in the church. John preached against the establishment. John preached against everybody who had sin. No matter who you were, John was saying, repent. Change your ways, be sorry for your sin, and look to God. Because the kingdom of God is near. He took on the hypocrisy of the church. He told the Roman soldiers to repent. He told the average Jew to repent and change your ways. And it drew people to him. But John wasn't a preacher in the city. John was a preacher who was on the outskirts. He was over by the Jordan River, out in the wilderness. And yet people came to see John. And when they saw him, they saw a quirky guy. A guy wearing clothes made of camel's hair. They saw a guy who had a diet that ate locusts and honey. And they go out to see this guy, and they listen to him. And as time goes on, John's followers go up and up and up. The crowd following John goes up and up and up, and his influence continues to spread throughout all of Judea. But then Jesus' ministry starts. And that's where we pick up in John chapter 3, beginning with, with verse 22. Here's what we're told. 
After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone is going to him. Let's stop right there. What, what's going on here? John is famous for what? Baptizing. And he's got all these followers coming to him. And then Jesus comes on the scene. And what is Jesus doing? He's baptizing also. Not that ministry is a product, but if we want to put it into business terms of the day, Jesus is offering the same exact product that is already on the market by John. And people are going to Jesus to get this. And it's detracting from John's followers. John's followers are going down. Jesus is going up. And people aren't happy. John's disciples aren't happy about this. Because in order to follow someone in that day, you couldn't follow two people at once like social media. You actually had to follow them. <laughs> you had to be physically present to follow them. And so if they're following Jesus now, guess what that means? They're not following John. And John's influence is going down. John's voice isn't being heard. John's followers are going to Jesus. And so John's followers pick an argument with a certain Jew over ceremonial washing. Most likely, it's all about who has the authority and who should be baptizing. John's followers are probably saying, look, Jesus' baptism, good, but it's not John's baptism. And so they come to John. And they say, look, Rabbi, uh, you know that guy you were on the other side of the river with? The guy you pointed out, well, here's the thing. He's baptizing too, and everyone's going to him. You're losing your influence, John. You're losing your influence. Here's how John responds. To this, John replied, A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. Notice what John says. A man can only have the authority that's given to him from heaven. What do you recognize? That, that in that moment, John had the authority, John had the following, John had the influence, because it was given to him from heaven. But when God takes that away, that's okay. Because it's given only from heaven. And then he has this great illustration, which is kind of lost on us because our marriages don't look like a wedding from the first century. But essentially, here's what a first century marriage looked like. Uh, there was the bride and the groom, the bridegroom. And then there was the best man, the friend of the bridegroom. Today, at our weddings, who does the best man hang out with all day on the wedding? The groom. First century, the best man hung out with the bride. He attended the bride. He helped the bride. He watched over the bride. He made sure that if any of the brides, if the bride had any need, he would make sure that it was filled. And he waited, and he waited until the wedding party came, led by the groom, to the bride's house, where then the marriage started. And in that moment, when groom comes, the friend, the best man, would hand the bride to the groom, and he had the joy of giving the bride away. John says, this is my joy. Jesus is the groom. The Christian church is the bride. And John says, I get the joy of handing the church over to the groom of Jesus Christ. And then what happens is the best man in that situation goes into the back. He's no longer the focal point. John says, this is what needs to happen. Jesus needs to become greater. I need to become less. 
Not exactly a wise advice for an influencer, is it? Imagine a politician standing up and saying, you know what you need to do? Not vote for me, but vote for him or her. It would never happen. Imagine a social media influencer getting on social media and saying, I need my followers to decrease and go to that person who's offering the same product as me. It wouldn't happen. And yet this is what makes John such a great influence because John isn't about his own ego. He's not about himself. Instead, what's he all about? Pointing people's eyes to their Savior. That's what made John so great. Is he pointed people's eyes to the Messiah. He needs to be greater. I need to be less, John says. So what do we learn about this? What do we learn for ourselves today? Two things. First thing is your first point. We are under the influence of those we follow. We are under the influence of those who follow. Thank God that the people who follow John followed John. Because John pointed their eyes back to Jesus. It could have ended very differently if John would, John's pride got in the way, if his ego got in the way, if John wanted it to be all about him. He could have caused major division and led people away from the Savior. He had that kind of influence to lead people away from Jesus, but he didn't. He led people to the Savior. And so the question we have to ask ourselves today is whose influence are we under? I thought about this, that this week as I was working through all this, and I thought about it for myself, and uh, my pride and my ego started to stand up and punch in my inner self and say, I'm under nobody's influence. I'm my own man. I stand on my own two feet, and I make my own decisions. Thank you very much. And yet that's not true, is it? We're all influenced by somebody. Whose influence are you under? Is it a politician? Your spouse? Teachers? Co-workers? Whose influence are you under? This is a key question for us to ask as we're considering the battle for the throne of our hearts because it happens so subtly that we don't even realize it. And next thing you know it, that person is elevated to the throne of our hearts as we listen to them above Jesus. You see, if it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's a pastor, a teacher, a, a friend, a spouse, if they are leading us away from our Savior, if they're leading us to, to have a small view of Jesus and a greater view of them or a greater view of ourselves, we need to not listen to them. Jesus needs to be greater and they need to be less in our lives. If you're following someone who is telling you that you aren't beautiful unless you change X, Y, or Z about yourself, and if they're encouraging you that you aren't beautiful just the way that God created you, then that person needs to become less in your eyes, and Jesus needs to be greater. If people of influence in your lives are, are encouraging you or, or telling you, influencing you to believe that your value, your worth, the fact that you matter, is in anything other than the cross of Christ and his shed blood for you, they need to be less in your life and Jesus needs to be greater. If, you're, if, if somebody is influencing you to find your identity in, in the clothes you wear, in the job that you have, in your gender, in your sexual orientation, that person needs to become less in your life and Jesus needs to become greater. If you're looking for relationship advice, if you're looking for parenting advice and, and you follow someone and they're influencing you and you listen to them but you never open up the Bible to hear what Jesus has to say about these things, that person needs to become less in your life and Jesus needs to become greater. Jesus needs to be the greatest influence in our lives. That doesn't mean you can't follow these people. It doesn't mean you can't listen and, and take what they say, but we need to discern what they say with what Jesus says. How is what they are saying, what are they leading us to believe, where are they leading us to look, and is it in line with what Jesus says? If not, Jesus needs to take precedence. He needs to be greater, 
and they need to be less. And thankful, thankfully for the people, John was that kind of influencer. Jesus needs to be greater, I need to be less. And the same is true with the people that we follow and have influence in our lives. But we also learn something else. Christians care less for ourselves and more for Jesus. What do we mean by that? What do we mean by we care less for ourselves and more for Jesus? John didn't gain an audience for himself. It was all about Jesus. It was all about Jesus. And the same is true for us. I don't think any of us have aspirations to be a celebrity. But do we have aspirations to be a celebrity within our circle of friends? Within our circle of influence? Because we all have a circle of influence. All of us are a John to someone. All of us have influence over, over the people in our lives and in our circle. And how are we influencing them? Are we caring more about ourselves, our reputation, our ego, our pride, or are we pointing people's eyes to our Savior Jesus? I'm a pastor and I stand up here every week and I preach to you and you listen for the most part. And you listen. If there ever comes a day when you feel like I'm trying to gain more followers for Stephen Apps and not for Jesus, you should leave our church. You should never be here to follow Stephen Apps. You should be here because I'm pointing your eyes to your Savior Jesus. And the day that stops, you should leave. For our teachers, what makes you more happy? What brings you more joy? Is it to see a parent post on Facebook about how great of a teacher that you are and how they love that, that their kids in your class? Or does it bring you more joy to see them post about their Savior Jesus? For all of us in our circle of influence, do we try to look strong? Do we try to, to, to look like we have it together at the expense of Christ? Are we willing to look weak apologize? Are we willing to, to say, I'm struggling with this, if it means that Jesus looks greater in the eyes of our circle of influence, even if it makes us look less? We all have influence in other people's lives, and we care less for ourselves and more for Jesus as we influence people. We want to point people's eyes to Jesus. He needs to be greater. I need to be less. Why? We haven't really answered that yet, have we? Why does Jesus need to be greater? John doesn't say. He just says he needs to be greater, I need to be less. Yeah, he said he's the groom and, and the church is the bride, but why? And it's actually told for us right at the end of John chapter 3 here. Here's how John 3 ends. Oops, I don't have that there, so let's look at our worship folder. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Whoever believes in the Son has what? Eternal life. Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. Whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. Life. That is something that John couldn't grant. That's something that you can't grant. That's something that the people that have influence in your lives can't grant. Only Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. He doesn't push a product. He doesn't push some strategy or some policy to, to heal the country. Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus grants you eternal life. Nobody else can do that. You come to Jesus and you come with all of the, your heaping amount of guilt, your heaping amount of shame and your sins that are so great and yet what do you find in Jesus? The forgiveness that he won for you at the cross is greater. You come and, and you look into the future and your health isn't looking good 
uh, you know that this life ends in death, and it's dark, and it's bleak, and it, you feel hopeless, and yet the hope in Jesus is greater because he rose from the dead. The resurrection's real, and your life doesn't end in the grave, but it ends in eternal life with your Savior. You, you look at the division in our country, and you see just how divided everyone is, and it seems like a hopeless situation, and then we come to our Savior Jesus, who's taken two parties that are further apart than any party has ever been, and he's united them. And who are those parties? God and you. God and me. Jesus has reconciled you to the God of this world through the shedding of his blood. There is always hope in your Savior. No matter the division in your life, no matter the, the disunity, no matter, no matter what's going on, there's always hope because your Savior is the greatest reconciler that's ever been and can ever be. He's the God of this world, and through his shed blood, you have peace with God. There is nobody greater. Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. John couldn't do that. Stephen Apt can't do that. You can't do that. No one else can do this for you except for Jesus. And when we know what our Savior's done for us, when we know the forgiveness and how great it is, when we know the, the, the hope of eternal life, it changes us. All of that influences you and me to have what? Peace, hope, and joy. Even in a world where peace, hope, and joy are lacking. This is why Jesus needs to be greater. And we need to be less. This is why Jesus needs to be the greatest influence in our lives. Because he and he alone grants eternal life. But here's the thing. After Jesus has influenced us and changed our life, we now get to influence others. And that's your last point today. We've been influenced by Jesus in order to influence for Jesus. Isn't that what we see in John? How does John empty himself of his ego and his pride? How does he not make it about him and, and wants to point people's eyes to Jesus? Because he's sure of eternal life. He's sure of the Savior Jesus and what, what he is, who he is, and what he would accomplish. And when you and I are assured of eternal life, when we have the peace and the hope and joy that come from the forgiveness of sins, we have been influenced by Jesus, so that now we can go and influence others for Jesus. How? This is what that graphic is that you probably saw as I scroll by it, and I hope you can see it. Uh, this is going to be posted on our social media this week. Five ways for you to influence others through social media. Number one, post something positive. Don't post something that's negative, but post positive things. Share a prayer. Share a Bible verse. Like, comment, and share what we post as a church so that it goes on your timelines and your followers see it. And then finally, be involved at church. As we take pictures here at church, you'll go up on our social media. People can see you, and they can see the influence that you have. And th through those actions, you will influence others for their Savior Jesus, as you point their eyes to the God of this world who grants eternal life. We've been influenced by Jesus so that we can influence for Jesus. This is where people fall. They fall under our Savior Jesus, and we all look up to him who sits on the throne, the throne in heaven, the throne in our hearts. He alone changes our lives. He alone grants us eternal life. And so let's take that influence that's been had on us and go and influence others and point their eyes to our Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we praise and thank you for John, uh, the influence that he had on others to point their eyes to you, the only Savior. We thank you for the influences in our lives uh, that have pointed our eyes to you as well. Guard our egos, guard our prides, and let them all point to our Savior, to you, 
Uh, let us have influence uh, over others and let us influence them for eternal life so that they too may be assured of the forgiveness of sins that you've offered to them, that you've won for them, that life eternal that you've won by the resurrection of the dead. Let us be assured of this and fill us with hope, joy, and peace every single day. In your name we pray. Amen.